Hey you guys, well let's take a few minutes to go over the functions of line. Now this is different than the types of line. Types of lines are different styles of line that you can use in a work of art. Functions of line are what do they do for us? What are their functions within a particular work of art? And so let's talk about some of those things that line does. One of the things that line does for us is they create outlines and contour. So if you think of um, outline, you would think of just going around the outer edges of an object. If you're thinking about contour lines, you're talking about descriptive lines that explain shape or form to us. So for example, um, the outline, you could go around here, and that would all be that outline, but I need these extra lines inside to show me that her foot is there or that you know this is the neckline of her blouse or her hair is pulled back in this certain way. So we need those extra lines that describe form and um, sometimes we think of them as essential descriptive lines. Those are contour lines. Let me give you a good example. So if I put this outline up, could you tell what it is? Now, sometimes shapes are super obvious. If I traced my hand, you'd go, well, sure, it's a hand. But if you look at this one, you go, hmm, I don't know. Some people tell me they think it's a bed, you know. I, you know, I've had different people try to come up with ideas. But it's really hard because what you need are the contour inside lines that describe it, the form, for you. So if I, tell, if I show you that, would you have come up with a dish rack full of dishes? Probably not. You needed this information that line can give you. That's a contour line, okay? The red line is an outline. The inside lines are contour lines. Line also provides direction in a work of art, and usually a work of art is dominated by one of three directional types of lines. Horizontal is one, and so as you can see in this particular work, you've got, a, you've got a strong horizontal line down here. You've got another horizontal line here. Even the horizon, the trees create one, this line where the horizon, uh, where the ground meets the water, that would create another one. So there's some super, super strong horizontal lines. Horizontal lines are usually considered peaceful lines, um, relaxed lines. We even say we're going to get horizontal, right, when we think about it. So anything that is dominated by horizontal lines usually has a very calming effect. Vertical lines, on the other hand, are dominating lines. They're aggressive lines. Um, they, they, show a, they provide a statement. They um, show power, authority, that sort of thing. It is not just a fluke that the Supreme Court of the United States has these super strong columns that go up there. You step up to here and you look up and your eyes are drawn up and it gives you that sense of um, authority that the people inside here must know what they're doing, right? They must have all the answers for me. Diagonal lines, on the other hand, um, describe motion, movement. And um, so if you look at somebody who's, you know, physically in motion, you can see really strong diagonal lines. Um, in this particular work, uh, you can see that we've got, it is really just built up around a, a core of uh, very strong diagonal lines. In a work like this, even though you know it seems like you know they're there this is the descent of the uh, descent from the cross uh, when they're bringing christ's body down from uh, the cross and everybody's lined up to do it they're still doing something so it's built around a very strong diagonal line uh, you can have more than one in a work of art so here is the um, the resurrection by piero della francesca and if you look over here, we have each of them. You have some diagonal lines, you have a horizontal line, and you have a vertical line. But if you have them all, chances are, for the most part, the vertical line will dominate if there are all three in there. Um, lines also do modeling and shading for us, right? We, it's important that if you want something to have some sort of realism to it, that you can see lights and darks in it. You can see where lights hit 
you know, uh, the nose or whatever. And we can use line to do that. Sometimes that is your only option when you're drawing or painting or whatever you're doing is that you can, you only can use lines to do this because maybe you're drawing with a pen and a pen only allows you to do lines. You can't just push hard on a pen, right? A felt tip pen or something and it gets darker. It just lays down the black. That's it. So what do you do? Well, we do what we call crossing and hatching, hatch, hatching and cross hatching, excuse me. And so hatching are simply parallel lines. They don't cross over each other. They just run side by side, literally parallel to each other. The closer they get, the more it feels a little bit darker. Uh, the further apart, a little bit lighter. Then if you start going, putting them down and then counter crossing with other lines, that's called cross hatching. And of course, the more lines that get in there, the darker it begins to feel. So when you look at this pen and ink drawing by Michelangelo, you can see both of these in play, right? So if we look here, you see hatching lines. They're all parallel, right? These are all just parallel lines here. But you get up into the cheek area and you see he wanted to get it darker. So he started to cross those lines and used um, cross hatching. Sometimes in um, other types of artwork, we might have this happen too. In printmaking, this happens. This is a woodcut by the artist Albert Dürer, And he, you can see, has used hatching lines to create uh, that sense of light and dark in a work of art. In this, he actually cuts out of a wood block. And he cuts all those, uh, he actually cuts around the lines is how this happens. And then when he gets it all cut the way he wants, he inks up, puts a, you know, uses a brayer and puts ink across the top of the wood cut. And then he runs prints of it. And that's what this is. But that would be the only way you could make lights and darks in a wood cut is just using hatching and cross hatching lines. Um, it is difficult to cross hatch on a wood cut because of the grain. You see that happen more in um, maybe a linoleum block or something else. Um, I'm throwing this in here because I'm not exactly sure where else to put it, but um, artists often do what we call stippling in drawing or pointillism in painting, and that is they use dots instead of lines, and the closer the dots are together, you can kind of see it here in the skin and, and around that they're using this pen and just laying down um, dots. This is a drawing, that a pen and ink drawing that was done with dots, and it's from a distance, the dots are so small, it's just even hard to tell. But if you come up here and look closer in the hair, you can see it, right? You can see all the little dots that comprise that particular work of art. So stippling and pointillism would also be a part of modeling and shading. Uh, lines also create movement in a, in a work of art so that sometimes artists want you to go to a certain place or location in a work of art, and they can use lines to make that happen. So if we think about maybe some of the types of line that this artist used, you can say, well, he used psychic line, and he gets me to look here because everyone looks there, right? We talked about this before. People want, want to see what we're all looking at. Um, this is an implied line where these two edges meet, and it's very strong headed right there too. So he's using both implied line and psychic line to get us to go to where he wants in a work of art. So artists could use line as movement. Um, you could also kind of indicate movement in a work of art by use of line. And this is something, this is a work that I did a while back. And if I, I just use line to kind of create um, the trajectory or trace the movements of these butterflies and give that sense that they're just buzzing all over the place and moving all over. Um, you can also follow edges through a work of art. So all of these lines push you through and get you to move. Uh, line also creates pattern and texture in a work. So in this particular work, now remember, a pattern is a motif or a little design of something 
that is repeated in a predictable order or sequence. So in this particular work, we have a line. It repeats in a very predictable order or sequence. You expect it to happen again. That is a pattern. And lines are, are used quite often to create patterns in a work of art. Texture, on the other hand, is more random. So in this particular work, you can look and you can go red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. Okay, that sets up a pattern for us. But in this particular work, there it's not so organized, right? There's not a predictable sequence happening here. And yet at the same time, the lines actually give us a sense of um, surface quality that it you, you you sense the little hair that's being created so that's what we would think of as a texture in a work of art so these are some of the functions of line that artists use um, in their artworks <laughs>